Uh, thanks very much for coming today, Philippa. For those of you who don't uh, know Philippa's background, she was born in Belfast, spent the first 10 years of her life there before moving with her family to Scotland. And she uh, was educated partly in London and then at Douglas Academy in Mulgai. Went to Glasgow University where she studied medicine and has obviously been uh, had a very distinguished career in medicine ever since. Uh, including uh, 18 years as a consultant uh, breast cancer surgeon at Cross House, just across the water. Uh, Philip has also um, been uh, an international volunteer in medical matters, uh, spent time as a volunteer with the United Nations in Gaza, and most recently, uh, two or three years ago, um, took part of our summer recess uh, from Westminster to do volunteer work again in Gaza. So uh, we're delighted to have you here, Philippa, to talk about Brexit in the NHS, and thanks for coming. Thank you very much. <laughs> Obviously, I have spent the last three years, actually before the referendum, because I was doing speeches and writing articles, talking about all the great health benefits we've had from being in the EU, and please don't throw them away. So it was, I was able to do positive speeches and positive articles. Unfortunately, over the last three years, my speeches have become serially more negative. Um, and I apologize if any of you are feeling distressed or depressed at the end of the evening. You can come and I'll try and give you some counseling uh, when we get to the end. But I've spent three years trying to get the health impacts of Brexit onto the government's agenda. I've been ignored, I've been patronized, I've had a load of cheek in the chamber. And now, of course, you'll have seen the Yellowhammer report, which literally lists all the things that I've been talking about for the last three years. And that's the issue. The EU is not just about trade. We as individuals, whether we're businesses or not, have gained by being in Europe for the last 40 years, and particularly from a health point of view. Now, looking at the things, and many of you may have seen the NHS for YES leaflets um, that I think the group were, were, were sharing out, the first one that people will notice is the impact on workforce. Across the piece, it's about 6% of our workforce comes from Europe, including my husband, who's parked himself over there, who's been a GP in our system for over 30 years and comes from Germany. So Germany trained him but we've actually had all the benefit of them for all of that time. And the problem is, since the EU referendum, there's been a 90% drop in European nurses coming to the UK. 90%. In essence, it has dried up because they don't feel welcome. They feel unsure. The whole message coming out of the EU has been anti-foreigner. And for the people who were already here, some of whom were looking for citizenship, some of whom are going through the settlement scheme at the moment. Unfortunately, it's not proving remotely as straightforward as the government keep claiming. I'm involved in helping European citizens who've been here for decades trying to get their settled status. A lady who'd been here for 30 years and was refused universal credit because, oh, it's not clear to us that this is your residence. You know, she was married to a British person, she had a son here. Uh, I mean, a whole lot of reasons that showed that she had actually made her life here. And she's not alone. And what's happening at the moment is many people, instead of getting settled status, which gives them some protection, not as good as what they had under freedom of movement, they seem to be getting pre-settled status. Now, that's designed for people who haven't been here five years. Actually, it's been given to people who've been here 10, 15, 20 years. And pre-settled status actually gives you almost nothing. So gradually, these people are just becoming more and more insecure, and they're leaving. Now, the problem is, in Scotland, we are 8.3% of the population, but we live on one-third of the UK landmass. We need more people, not less people. And particularly those who work in our universities as researchers or who work as our GPs and hospital consultants or our nurses or our social care workers. There's parts of the Highlands where 30% of the social care workers are European. 
And actually, even for medics and nurses, the further you go into the highlands and onto the islands, the higher the proportion of European citizens. Because they love our mountains and our fjords and the, the wilderness and the way of life, and they're particularly attracted to that way of life. We lived on Mull for a year, and if it wasn't that I couldn't find surgical work for me, he'd have happily stayed, because exactly that reason. He absolutely loved being a GP on Mull. So the problem is, is either we could lose them, or when they retire, we're going to struggle to recruit people to replace them. So the threat to Scotland of our public service workforce, but also simply our population. Our working age population is already falling. We need more people to come to Scotland, whether from Europe or wider afield. We need more people. And the problem is with London having this, oh, we're going to cut migration, we're going to limit the numbers, that will be absolutely disastrous for Scotland. And you think a small rural village anywhere in Scotland, if you can't get a GP and you can't keep a hold of your primary school teacher, you're losing older people, you're losing families, and actually your village just starts to wither away. And we can't afford to have a new clearances where we just depopulate into the central belt because we haven't got enough people to support our rural and island communities. Now, the second one is drugs and medicines. Obviously, we've lost the European Medicines Agency from London, and that took away nearly a 1,000 high-quality jobs, and also a lot of other pharmaceutical firms who based themselves in London to be near it. But actually, a much bigger problem isn't the EMA leaving us. It's the fact that the UK is leaving the European Medicines Agency. It's a single licensing system for the whole of the EEA. So 500 million people. And because of that, from the laboratory bench to the patient is much shorter now than it was when I was doing research in breast cancer. And the thing is that new drugs launch in America and Europe at virtually the same time because of the size of that market. Canada and Australia get new drugs about six months to a year later. Well, suddenly the UK is a much smaller market. And I've had pharmaceutical firms say to me that even they might delay further because if a drug is expensive, it can take even longer to get into the NHS. So many of them are beginning to think, well, there won't be a great rush to have to pay yet another fee to go through yet another process to license their drug just for the UK when actually they get access to 450 million people through one process over here. The EMA has also directed a lot of funding, particularly to rare diseases and rare childhood diseases, that it's very difficult to study in any one country. But again, in a population of 500 million, you can gather enough patients with these rare diseases together to actually come up with new drugs, to come up with trials. And we've made more progress in terrible childhood diseases in the last 10 to 15 years than in decades before that. And of course now in Yellowhammer and talking about no deal, people are conscious of, well, what's going to happen to drugs at the border? Now it isn't just in a no deal situation that things like radioisotopes or drugs will be slowed down. I mean, even with a deal, the border will not be how it is now. But of course, people are suddenly conscious of it because it's being discussed around no deal. I've raised the issue of radioisotopes, which we use for bone scans, staging cancer patients. Some of them we use even to treat cancer. Now, any of you who did physics at school will remember that radioisotopes have a half-life. So after a certain period of time, you've only got half the radioactivity. Well, the one we import has a half-life of 66 hours. And yet they are talking about lorries sitting at Calais for two and a half days. Well, that's your 66 hours. You've bought the molybdenum to bring in. You've now got half the value. So whether you've got less doses to use for patients or whether you're ending up flying it in, it's all going to be more expensive. And that is going to take money out of the NHS, increase costs, and may have people who are turning up to get a scan 
and frankly, there isn't a dose left for them. I have again raised that repeatedly for three years, was even told to Google what the French government were doing. That was a response in the, in the chamber. But also, the UK virtually doesn't make any insulin. We import almost all of our insulin. Now again, they have made a kind of 12-week stockpile of that. But what if the chaos goes on for six months, the way Yellowhammer talks about? So it's natural that people who are on these critical medications are anxious. And we're seeing a lot of shortages now, not because of Brexit per se, but because of the stockpiling. Because you only stockpile in two ways. Either you increase production, which is not always possible, or you cream a wee bit off the top every day and put it into your stockpile. And of course, that means you're creating a shortage. And we've seen the normal incidence of shortage drugs, which runs around 25 to 30 at any one time, due to manufacturing problems or raw material problems, it's running at about 160 drugs. And we haven't even hit Brexit yet. The third one, and I would hope anybody sensible in here has in their wallet that little plastic card called your European Health Insurance Card that allows you, if you're visiting the Munich Bear Festival, you have a wee refreshment too many, fall over and break your leg. This was not booze, by the way that you're treated as if you were a German citizen. They fix you. Now that's been an amazing thing. And the, particularly, it allows people who have chronic conditions, even renal dialysis, to arrange to be dialyzed three times a week if they went on holiday in Europe. Now I know lots of people say, oh, I always take travel insurance. But your travel insurance is cheaper for Europe because it's underwritten by the EHIC scheme. And I defy anyone in here to show me insurance that would cover renal dialysis. So you're talking about people who are able to go for a break to Europe now, who simply will not be able to travel in the future. Our pensioners, who've never paid a penny of tax in the south of France or Spain, they've been able to transfer their health and social care rights to those countries through the freedom of movement system, through the S1 system. Now, if that is not preserved afterwards, they're not going to be able to afford to stay there and have expensive private health insurance. I mean, trying to get comprehensive private health insurance in your 70s when you've already got four conditions will be very difficult. And for many, what will be excluded is exactly what you have. So what we might see is actually people ending up coming home. And if they were all pulling out of any area at any particular time, of course, a whole lot of properties are going to go on the market. The market will sink. They will have negative equity. They could be coming back here unable to sell their apartment and needing a home as well as health and social care. So one of these opportunities that we've had that everyone just took for granted, thought nothing about, we are now going to lose. And while people say, well, we should keep those bits, well, I'm sorry. These things were not designed for a hen night in Prague. These systems were designed for freedom of movement. Because freedom of movement is worth nothing if you do not have social security, protection, and health care. That's why they're there. So we can't opt out of all the big bits and then pick out some of the juicy things we like. You know, I know Boris thinks cake and eat it. Brexit is perfect, but that just simply isn't going to happen. Now, Europe is also the biggest research network in the world. It's bigger than America, bigger than China. And we've been part of it. The UK has been the number one net gainer from research over the last 10 years. We're already slipping down the rankings. And I know people that I worked with when I was doing cancer research and when I was working as a breast cancer surgeon who their project is now becoming Europe-wide and they're being asked to step aside. Because they say, you could be involved, but we can't have you leading the project now. Um, we're gonna have to have a, a different primary investigator. And the thing is, Again, freedom of movement is critical to that. About a quarter of our university um, researchers, lecturers, are from Europe. They're European citizens. And often the best research 
is across that whole network. Well, you need to be able to hop on a plane to fly over to sort an experiment that's not working. You need to be able to move easily. You need to be able to share data. That isn't even remotely sorted out. And the problem is there is now a new clinical trial system that's making it slicker and easier for people to register a trial, put in data, analyze it together right across Europe. And we're going to be like the kitty looking into the sweet shop on the outside. And the problem is we will lose our best people. If the UK is no longer the top place to be doing clinical research, then those people will be attracted to somewhere else. So while obviously it's health, research is just upstream. That's where our future treatments come from. That's where our innovations come from. And on top of that, we have the ridiculous situation that they plan to offer a three-year student visa when our courses are four years. Now, I was on the committee that did that piece of work, and I pointed it out straight away. And we are six months, more than six months down the line, and they absolutely refuse to change it. That is going to damage, again, our universities. It's going to make it almost impossible to attract overseas students if in their third year, in the middle of their honours year, they actually have to do battle with the Home Office on top of writing their dissertation. Because that's what we've been told. Oh, they can apply for a Tier 4 visa in third year. It's just ridiculous. That's how little interest or care they have for how things work in Scotland. And the other benefit that we've had from the EU has actually been a lot of our public health measures. It's often been the EU that has kept the pressure on about cleaning up the rivers, cleaning up our beaches, cleaning up our water, trying to tackle air pollution in cities. What's going to happen when the pressure comes off? When I was a young surgeon, getting predominantly men in with industrial injuries, torn fingers, torn limbs, chemical burns, thermal burns, I mean, it was 10 a penny. But health and safety has been strengthened over the years as workers' rights, as maternity rights, as paternity rights have all been strengthened under pressure from the EU. Now, you all know who's in charge of the UK at the moment. You know that they are disaster capitalists who will be looking to make lots of money out of this and cut the red tape as they describe it. But one man's red tape is another man's life and limb. And let's face it, none of us in this room are going to be making millions of pounds out of Brexit. We will be the ones who lose the protections. And as well as the things that we are losing directly from Europe that we have gained over these decades, is Brexit's being used to undermine our parliament at Holyrood. Now, I don't think they're brave enough to shut it down but they will eviscerate it. They will turn it into nothing but a talking shop. They've already re-reserved power over 24 devolved areas, like farming, like fishing, food standards, food safety, food labeling, geographic indicators. You look at the list, and it's totally obvious what it's about. It's about doing a trade deal with Trump. Everything on that list is about selling Scotland out. Now, I've read the trade papers from America, and their number one demand is no protected geographical indicators. So they want the protection on Scotch whiskey to be removed, and they demand the right to sell their whiskey as Scotch. And that's just the first one. And obviously, you've heard lots about hormone-injected beef and chlorine-washed chicken. It's not about washing the chicken in chlorine. You know, you've all been swimming in a swimming pool. It's why they wash their chicken in chlorine, because their animal husbandry standards are much poorer. And that's the question. And because they're taking control over food labeling, you may not even have a choice, because you simply won't know what you're eating. And all of these things, these have been under the control of Holyrood for 20 years, and they're being taken away. Now, the Scottish government accepted that there was a need to agree UK-wide frameworks. All they asked 
was that those frameworks should be agreed. Westminster said no. They had to have the right to impose them. And if you remember, that's what led to our walkout from Westminster. Because they kept saying, well, we'll put down the amendments, we'll change this, we'll change this. They changed it in the House of Lords. Oh, there'll be lots of time to debate this when it comes back to the Commons. 17 minutes, all used by the minister. Not a single Scottish MP of any colour got to make any comment on it. And then Labour abstain. You know, they say they're the party of devolution. They didn't even stand up for it. And one of the things that really concerns me is a power away down at the bottom of the list that people think is a bit technical and they don't really notice. And that's power over public procurement. So how services are bought, how contracts are put out to tender, and that would apply to our NHS. So having fought to protect our NHS as a single public entity, delivered publicly, unlike in England, they would suddenly have the ability to say, all public contracts have to be put out to tender. Now, we don't know if they will, but why would we be happy that they have the power to do that? Because that's what they did to their own NHS. The Health and Social Care Act, section 75 of that, said all contracts that could technically be put out to tender had to be. And that was the law. Now, I've been fighting that while I've been down the road, and, and they're talking about maybe stepping back from it a bit. But it's still the law in England. So when six commissioning groups in Surrey tried to roll back from this. Now, they weren't breaking contracts with Virgin Care. The contracts had come to an end, but they recognized, you know, actually, that wasn't really good. These community services weren't good enough. We want to take them back into the NHS. And what did Virgin do? They do what they always do. If they're not awarded a franchise, they sued them. Now, it's all very secret how much they paid to settle out of court. But one of the CCGs accidentally let loose that it was over 300,000 that they had had to pay. So with the six, you're talking over two million pounds that went to Virgin for suing commissioners for wanting to take these Virgin Care services back under the NHS. That's two million pounds that's not spent on hip replacements or drugs or modernizing hospitals or anything else. And it's all these things that are pulling NHS England apart and fragmenting it. And it's not just NHS competing with private. NHS trusts are competing with each other. So it's very difficult to develop joined up pathways for patients. It's very confusing. And frankly, I'm not happy at the idea that the ultimate power over public procurement would now sit back in Westminster. Now, health is not just about the NHS. Everyone thinks health equals NHS. It doesn't. The NHS is there to catch you when you fall, to patch you up, to help keep you going. But health actually comes from the start you have in life, from you know how healthy your mother was before you were born, what kind of food you're having, what kind of home you live in, what kind of education you get. And if you're cold and hungry, what kind of chance of an education do you have? And what many people don't know is the Scottish government is one of the founders of the well-being economy government's global group with New Zealand and Iceland. Everyone's going, oh, look at Iceland. They're doing a well-being economy. Well, that's because they were inspired by the Scottish government's policy of inclusive growth. Instead of always just talking about growth, you know, more and more growth in the economy. Yeah, but who's gaining from it? And it should be shared among everybody. But there are now several countries working, as the First Minister said in her recent TED talk, about trying to put the well-being of citizens more at the centre, not just how big is your GDP, how much money is the, the country making, how fast is it growing? What's the point in it growing fast if we're all skint? What's the point of it growing fast if actually 10% of that's due to criminality? It's important that we're actually thinking about our citizens because that's who we have responsibility for. And to me, that's always been clear. As a breast cancer surgeon 
involved very much in the palliative care of my patients who were unlucky enough to not make it through the disease. I know that when you're walking that last bit of your life, there's only two things that matter. One is you really wish you had your health. You look back to all the stuff you did when you were younger, or even all the stuff you didn't do when you were younger, when you should have done it, because you could have done it, and the people you love. That is literally all there is in life. I've never met anyone near the end of their life who was fretting about the size of their car, the size of their house, the size of their bank account. It's about being well, in the global sense of well-being. And to me, we need to focus on the physical, the mental, and environmental well-being of our citizens. And not just the citizens we have now, but also our future generations. We're making decisions that will affect our children, that will affect our grandchildren. I mean, Brexit is absolutely a point in case. We are taking opportunities away from them. We need to tackle the climate crisis because otherwise we are going to leave these problems for them. So it's trying to think in that more global way. And actually, if you look at some of the policies that the Scottish government have had over the last 10 years, from the baby box, to free early learning and childcare, to keeping tuition free for our students, to free prescriptions, to free personal care for our older citizens. We're the only one of the four UK nations that provides free personal care. And in England now, things like hip and knee replacements, cataract surgery is being rationed to an appalling level. And some of you might have seen on social media the NHS My Choice, where if you don't get over the hugely high bar to get your hip replaced by the NHS, you can get it done on the NHS, but it's going to cost you 18 grand. Well, either you need it done, in which case the NHS should do it, or if you don't need it done, you shouldn't be just having an operation because you have a notion for it. Operations are dangerous. So to me, this is an absolute disaster, an absolute paradox that they are allowing people to be paying the NHS to do operations that are things that are important to keeping our older citizens mobile. If you can see and you can walk and you can get down the town with your bus pass, you'll stay a lot sharper up here than if you're stuck in your house in pain. We don't just believe in independence for Scotland. We believe in independence for everybody and independence for our older citizens because that's what gives people quality of life is to be able to lead their life to the best of their ability and to the best of the quality of life that can be delivered them. But the things that affect that, the biggest driver of ill health is poverty. And I'm sorry, the biggest driver of poverty are the policies that come out of Westminster. If you look, child poverty, pensioner poverty, and disabled poverty had all been going down, and now they're all going up. Now, the turn wasn't at the crash in 2008. The turn was after the 2012 welfare cuts. And to me, it is so short-sighted. We have one in five people living in poverty in Scotland, but we have one in four children living in poverty. And yet, that's the best figure in the UK. In England, it's over 30% of children living in poverty. And it doesn't make any sense. If you invest in children at the beginning of their lives so that they can do well at school because they're not cold and they're not hungry and they're getting a decent education and they live in a decent house and they can get a job, you're not patching them up afterwards. If you don't invest in them and they end up unemployed or in the criminal justice system or addicted to drugs or alcohol or whatever it is, you're constantly pouring money in to patch them up afterwards. And what we've been trying to do here in Scotland is to look at putting that money in straight up front instead of trying to pick up the pieces afterwards. And that's what I mean about trying to have a well-being approach to government. The Scottish economy has lost 3.7 billion pounds in welfare cuts. 
along with another two billion cut from our economy, from our budget, sorry. That's six billion that would be being spent in our butcher shops and our bakers and keeping our local economies going, but it isn't because it's not there. And to me, it's that looking at how you're keeping local families, local economies going by putting the money, not up here where the rich people are, at the top of the pyramid, but down at the bottom, where everybody else is. Because that money then gets spent. It'll still end up in the hands of the rich, but it'll have spiraled up the economy multiple times. We know trickle-down economics doesn't work. It's trickle-up. So it's looking at investing in ordinary people, in their well-being, in their quality of life. And frankly, there isn't a snowball in hell's chance of any policy approach like that if we are still attached to Westminster. That is not their interest. That's not who votes Tory. And that's just not going to happen. So to me, we will be coming to another referendum. We will be coming to another decision and another chance to choose Scotland's future. And it's really important that we do. This isn't about, you know, people say, oh, separatists. Where is it they think we're going? You know, we're not planting charges across the Solway Firth and then sailing off into the Atlantic. I mean, I wouldn't mind if we went a wee bit further south. You know, the Med would be nice. But we'll still actually be in exactly the same place as we were before. So we're not going anywhere. The difference is just we would have the power over our own future. We would get to choose the policies. We would have the self-determination. And that's the important thing. We could decide to be in the EU or to be in the EEA. We could protect our parliament. We could turn our back on Tory austerity and start pushing the money we have to the people who need it most to try and actually have a fairer and healthier Scotland. So it is coming. And this general election, which I have to warn you, is definitely coming this autumn. So get your comfy shoes on. Is in essence the foothills of the next referendum. There are people who've fallen off the voters' roll since 2014. So we need to get more people to sign up to vote. Whatever way they're going to vote, they need to have the choice. They need to have their voice. And we need to make sure that we are getting people back onto the electoral roll. Now, the Tories, Labour and the Lib Dems don't want Scotland to have a voice and don't want us to have any choice. They think we should just, doesn't matter how bad it gets, and let's face it, it has got pretty bad down the road over the last six months. I think if you'd asked me at the beginning of the year, could we end up where we are now, I would probably have said, nah, I think that's, I think that's stretching it. But I think where we are now is pretty wild. So we will be coming to another decision. And the election that's coming is almost the foothills of that. Because those of you who are active will be having the conversations with people. This is the time of conversation. This election is basically the foothills of that independence referendum. And it's important that you utilize it to be having conversations with people. Don't fret about the when, when the date is. Now, I hope it will be soon, particularly with that big juggernaut that's coming towards us. But when you're talking to people, it's not about the when, it's about the why. And that's the conversations that you have to have with people. And any conversations need to be respectful. We need to recognize there are people in Scotland who believe in the union the way some of us believe in independence. And we're not going to change them. And what we should never be is rude to them. You wouldn't be rude to them to their face. So don't be rude to them on social media. I hate when I see people on Twitter having a stand-up fight with somebody. What's the point in that? You're certainly not going to convert them. But there'll be lots of people who voted no who see how you're speaking and think, oh gosh, they would speak to me like that. If someone is now open to consider that Scotland's future would be better in Scotland's hands. And let's face it, it couldn't be any worse than the hands it's in at the moment. Then you need to welcome people 
You need to have respectful conversations and you need to accept the multiple reasons why people voted no in 2014. And some people, people voted no for all sorts of reasons. Different things that they were told. I mean, look at the pension. Ask WASPy women what they think of the pension. Look at the, the OECD figures that show the, the UK pension at 29% of average earnings is the worst in the developed world. But oh yeah, that was held up as something marvelous in 2014. But to people in general, there was a status quo. And if you're not sure what decision, it's kind of quite easy to go, actually, you know what, let's just, the devil we know, let's stick with what we've got. And saying no and sticking to the status quo looked like a big, bright motorway. I know what this is. This is fine. I'm sticking with this. Independence looked like a wee turnoff, a wee country road with lots of trees, no streetlights. I'm not sure about that. And many people will have voted no purely for that reason. Well, the status quo doesn't exist anymore. We are simply at the fork in the road. And we, this time, there's not kind of multiple choices. There's only two choices. And that's the upheaval and chaos of Brexit or the upheaval of independence. And the difference is, if we choose to remain in the UK, we're stuck in the boot of Boris's car with some duct tape over our mouths. Or we can climb into the driver's seat choose our own path, make our own decisions. Now, it doesn't mean it will be easy. There isn't an independence fairy for anyone who was thinking there was. It won't happen overnight. We'll make mistakes. We will face problems that we will come up with solutions that suit Scotland, not solutions that are geared to the city of London. But just think of what an amazing thing it would be to be the generation that delivered that. That involves rolling your sleeves up, getting your bahuki off your chair, you might have to give me a wee minute, and actually getting on with building that Scotland that we all believe we could achieve. Because that's the Scotland that we want to live in and we want to give to our children and our grandchildren. Thank you.